Hi everyone, Kate here for another Victober video. I hope it's going really well for you. And this is a video I'm doing in honor of Stitch and Listen. where we are celebrating kind of um, handicraft and textiles uh, by doing some kind of handicraft while you listen to an audiobook. And I hope that it's going really well for you. And I just find it to be a really soothing practice to listen to an audiobook while I am doing some kind of handicraft. My, the two that I do the most are knitting and cross stitch. And this year I've been much more into cross stitch um, I hopefully will have a picture for you to insert here of a gift that I made for my sister and her husband and I was really proud of it and happy to give it and I took it with her to uh, get it framed and so now they can have it up and I was happy with how the end product turned out. Um, so a couple things I wanted to talk about today are some of the movements that happened within textiles within the Victorian era and also to focus on William Morris. If you saw my stitch and listen announcement video, then you'll see that I picked uh, a cross stitch of his tapestry, the tree of life. So I think he's a really fascinating person. His designs fascinate me. I'm just so drawn to the aesthetic that he has in them. But let's hop back a bit because the Victorian era to me is fascinating for many, many reasons. And I think a lot of it comes down to this sort of interaction of the old with the new. You know, we have farm culture and farm life and um, tradition being such a thing and religion being a big focal point of the culture. These are all things that now to a lot of the world seem really old and then interacting, colliding with the new, with the telephone, the train, um, photography becoming a thing, the printing press, you know, books being able to be made more cheaply than they ever had. And the entire industrial revolution, all of these things, uh, you know, colliding and make for a very interesting time within culture. And one of the things that you're going to see this effect is handicraft, is what people think beautiful garments are and what the purpose of things that are made should be and how should they be made. Uh, so we see kind of the design reform movement happen. And I did touch on this in regards to knitting uh, during last year when I hosted, when I was one of the hosts of Knit and Listen. And I will link that video down below if you would like to see more about Victorian knitting. Um, and then a couple years ago, I did talk also about the design reform movement and the arts and crafts movement uh, as regards a couple different Victorian novels. So I have touched on this before, but I have a little bit more that I wanted to say. And I think you'll find with your passions and the things that you are interested in, you'll find more and more the more you kind of delve into it. I listened to a couple podcast episodes this time on William Morris. And also I read a um, Kate Forsyth book on the pre-Raphaelites, which William Morris would have considered himself one of them. And the pre-Raphaelites were reacting to kind of what was going on around them with the Industrial Revolution. So like I said, the design reform movement happened when there were uh, women hired by the government to make certain garments and there were certain requirements and there was this uniformity with the garments and with embroidery. Certain, for the first time, patterns were printed and you could have patterns. Um, so you could have, you know, 10 different women would make a garment, make um, something embroidered, make something cross stitch, and it would look the same. This was the first time that happened before. It was very much um, kind of in the hands of the person who was doing the embroidering, doing the stitching, doing the cross stitching. And they would decide as they went on kind of the, des the design that they wanted to make it and um, much more kind of own the design. Whereas when you have a pattern, which is that's how I cross stitch because this is how, you know, I, I see that I've really been affected in the way that I do handicraft by the industrial revolution. And so it was the first time that patterns were printed out and there would be this really um, regimented kind of way of doing handicraft. 
and I did show a few years ago. Um, I started on a Berlin Woolwork, which this was a trend that started in the early Victorian era, Berlin Woolwork. And um, also it started because there the, were the, for the first time, they had access to all of these different dyes with bright pigments because they were using all these new chemicals to make them. And so these really vivid, bright colors, it was very popular to do them on black. Um, and so later on though, it was considered a very garish, uh, trend. So I love that I was like, Oh, I want to do it. It's something Victorian. And then when I looked into it more, it's actually, like I said, just considered very tacky. Um, but I really like how it looks. So I'd say, I think I'm 75% of the way through this. So I need to encourage myself that I have made it pretty far in this. Um, and when I look at the pattern, I'm definitely through more squares than I have to go. Um, so I'll hold it up for you. Let's see. I want to make sure it's not upside down. So I'm, I'm really happy with how this has come along and to see kind of what I've done um, over the years. In the two years since you've seen this, I could have finished it by now and it does bother me sometimes. You know, I'll set it down for months at a time and then when I pick it up, I'm always glad that I have picked it up. Um, so you can see I really am done with a lot of it and it's going to be such a like show-stopping piece to have framed and to have up. I can't wait to show everyone. Um, you know, I can't wait for guests to come in the house and they see it and it's it's going to be just so beautiful. So I'm really proud of the work that I've done, especially when I hold it up and I see it kind of as a whole because often, you know, you can see where the hoop was. I'm just looking at a close little piece. So then when you look out and you can see the whole picture, it's really nice. So I'll bring it up closer. So you can see more of it. So yes, I'm very proud of this. I'm happy with where I've come. I would love to finish this by the end of the year, especially now since I have a new big um, craft project that I've started. We'll see if I do. We shall see. So then William Morris ends up making different friends at the university that he's at, and they all have this kind of similar reaction to the industrial revolution and how it is affecting handicraft and that they think it's really cheapening art and it's cheapening design and they they form this arts and crafts movement to make people kind of slow down to have uh slow down with the art that they're making they call it slow art and think about what you're doing and to be very intentional and to not have everything be so uniform and to match one another to a t that's not the point of art art is to be creative and you should really kind of embracing what they thought that the dignity of art that you were kind of cheapening and taking away from the dignity when things were factory made. Um, and so they formed the arts and crafts movement and really encouraged there to be grace and beauty and dignity in all of the art. There was a very specific aesthetic to their art and they also thought of factory goods as dishonest and fake because it was a machine that made it. It wasn't somebody who spent, you know, hours and put love and care and time into it. It was a machine that did it. And it's really interesting, you know, to think about now we're so used to things being made by factories, but I think that is something that you could really think about um, in this time of transition, you know, during the industrial revolution, how things were being made not by hand anymore. And so many produced, you know, before it would take months to make a chair. And now how many dozens can you make? How many dozen chairs can you make in a week? Hundreds, you know? And um, so it, they were really thinking about that. And William Morris really embraced the importance of beauty in the home. And there's a quote, uh, he says, have nothing in your home, which you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. Which to me, that's like the original Marie Kondo. I think a lot of these um, things that uh, seem like such new ideas, if we look back, there's some of it in the Victorian era. And then they also loved uh, the classics. They loved like Greek mythology. And so I think maybe even that idea harkens back to the Greeks. I don't know. But I do know that also because of the Industrial Revolution, for the first time, people could just own so much stuff. 
So I really love that. Have nothing in your home which you do not know to be useful or believed to be beautiful. And it does bother me when there's something that I consider an eyesore in our house and I see it and like, why do we have that every time I pass by it? And I think it's good to be very intentional about what you acquire and what you're making. Um, all of that. I think it's all very good. So he formed then um, Morris and Company. And he thought the basic principle of this company is to have beautiful things in the home that are also useful. So for instance, they would have, you know, Victorian homes were very cold. So they would have curtains that were beautiful curtains, sort of tapestry style curtains that would cover the entire wall, not just the windows. And it would really insulate the heat. So it's something useful that's insulating the household, but it's also incredibly beautiful. So the Morrison company sold mostly fabrics and wallpaper. And what's really wonderful is that company is still around today. It did merge with another company, Sanderson and co. Uh, I think it was in the 90s. 1940s, but it's still around today. You can still purchase uh, William Morris's wallpapers. And now I really want to um, just, uh, I, I could picture, I think in one room, it could be neat to have wallpaper on one of the walls or two of the walls, and then have an accent color painted on the other walls uh, to kind of go with it. And I just am really, really enamored with his art. Um, and then he had a house, which they call just the red house that he had um, made. He had it specifically made and it's, it's supposed to harken back kind of to medieval times. And he was very intentional about every last aspect of the design. And in recent years, they have unearthed this huge mural um, that was done and it had been covered up by other layers of paint. And so it took long, careful hours and time to take the other layers of paint off and uncover this absolutely stunning mural. And I'm just, I just think about all of the time that he spent uh, painting that. And I think it's wonderful to think about spending that much time making a home beautiful. I think a lot of uh, the time in, in modern times, we don't do that and just putting so much care into it. And one of the things in particular that William Morris's art focused on is the natural world, natural beauty, and natural materials also. Um, so I'll show you some of the wallpapers um, that he used are just stunning and just every last detail, you know, you see the little lines on the leaves and um, just, he really loves to incorporate, like I said, things from the natural world. So leaves, flowers, birds, um, there's a trellis wallpaper also, all of these things. and just the amount of detail, this acanthus one, um, every last little, you know, curve on the leaves. It's just, you can tell so much time and care was spent on this art. And it has, uh, you know, people still love William Morris's art. It has truly stood the test of time. So I do think there really is something to what he was saying. One of William Morris and the Pre-Raphaelites biggest inspirations was John Ruskin. And John Ruskin uh, was very popular in the Victorian era. He was a writer and kind of in a nutshell, this is really shrinking things down, but he kind of thought beauty is morality. So whatever is beautiful, is noble, is worth pursuing. And you can see that then outstretching and overflowing into Victorian society where you were thought to be more moral if you had a more respectable appearance. So if you have a respectable house, you're, you're good to go. The Pre-Raphaelites also were very fixated on medieval times, kind of that idea of chivalry and this real um, romanticizing of the past. They have a lot of historical figures in their art. They were really uh, critical of people doing just society portraits of people from that day and age. They thought really the worthy and the noble things to do art were either medieval art or biblical art. Uh, there are some very famous paintings from that time from the Pre-Raphaelites of Jesus or Mary was very popular to do. And then with medieval times, Ophelia was a very popular one and the Lady of Shalott. These are ones that they just thought it was uh, just nobler and uh, kind of a higher beauty that they wanted to pursue. So they did a lot of paintings of those things and they just thought you should take your art very seriously and craft should be considered important. It should be noble and it should be worth your time and memorable. He also, William Morris was a very busy man because he also started Kelmscott Press 
and he had a lot of gilded books that got published and they would be very expensive. Um, so ironically, you know, he wanted the every man to pursue more noble art, but these books are, he was a man of contrast. These books are not a thing that the every man could, uh, you know, afford, but I will put up a couple pictures of these gilded Chaucers, which are just absolutely stunning. And just think every little curve and line was hand painted. So I, I can't imagine how expensive, if you had someone paint that today, how expensive that would be. Um, and he also learned to embroider because he was so, uh, such an advocate of handicraft and doing things on your own. He did calligraphy. Um, but what's interesting in the podcast that I heard, which I'll link down below, it's called Victorian Scribblers. They were saying he, in a way, kind of appropriated embroidery because he was set financially because of some investments that his father made. Even after his father's company that he worked for came crashing down, he was set financially. And he always felt a bit guilty about that money, but yet he did still live as a man of leisure. He had these projects, but he didn't have to do them or rely on them. And so he could pick up embroidery whenever he wanted and then set it down if he got bored with it. Whereas women that did it for work, they would sit 12 hours a day embroidering in whatever light they were able to get. They probably weren't able to afford gaslight. So there was, you know, doing it outside um, in daylight or by firelight, which there were a lot of women, I think, that really took a toll on their eyesight. And then we come to the Tree of Life, which I chose as my Victober cross-stitch project. This is quite the undertaking. It, um, you know, my Berlin wool work, I thought was quite the undertaking, and then this is just next level. But to me, it's so worth it. Once I will have it framed at the end, it will be such a showpiece to have. I cannot wait. Uh, you know, just to have it hanging up and thinking about where in the house I would have it hanging up. The very remarkable thing about the Tree of Life tapestry that William Morris created himself is that it was not based on a painting. Most people in that day and age, when they were making tapestries, would have a painting for reference, but he did it all as an original, as a tapestry. And I think the Tree of Life really went with the pre-Raphaelite aesthetic that they uh, you know, things being, um, symbolic and from, you know, medieval times, there was lots of symbolism in art, uh, that was set in that time. And the tree of life is such a, in so many different cultures, it's referenced and kind of this connection between this life and the next, and also kind of knowledge and, um, life and continual growth, all of these things. And it was just really went with his aesthetic. So, you know, me since, you know, I do, uh, Victober and I'm just obsessed with Victorian literature and now the Victorian era from loving Victorian literature so much. Uh, it makes me really happy that I found a couple different Victorian, um, kind of nods to the Victorian era with the cross-stitching that I am doing. And it can be fun to explain to someone uh, maybe who didn't know about William Morris or someone who didn't know about Berlin Woolwork, kind of these things that I think are really interesting, like I said, interaction of the old and the new colliding in that time during the 19th century. I hope you've enjoyed this video of some kind of little um, tidbits of information about design reform movement, arts and crafts movement, and uh, all of that together. So I hope you have a lovely day and are having a great October and I will talk to you later. Bye.